So welcome to part two of my video series uh, called Calibrating Time. In the previous video, we talked, we, I showed you how uh, to calibrate time to two different time scales. The original time scale is the current time scale, um, and it is calibrated to the cesium atom. And uh, when the cesium atom oscillates, 9,192,631,770 times. We call that one second. And so what I did in the previous video is I calibrated another time system I call S2 to uh, a different number of cesium oscillations in, in that system. I calibrated to 919,263,177 uh, uh, cesium atom clock ticks, okay, cesium atom oscillations, and calibrated the Planck's constant to both the, you know, normal time um, scale and the new time scale. And so, um, and I also explained why I believe that using um, the standard units is a little problematic and I don't actually believe that I'm scaling Planck's constant correctly due to uh, this flaw in the logic. And so in this video, what I'm going to do things differently, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to do it the way that I did in the, in the past couple of videos on this subject, and I'm going to show you why I believe this logic is flawed. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about how light is produced from a, uh, an atom, from a hydrogen atom, from any atom uh, in the periodic table. So here is a little uh, graphic um, that describes the emission spectrum of hydrogen. So when an electric current is passed through a glass tube that contains hydrogen gas at low pressure, the tube gives off a blue light. When this light is passed through a prism, as shown in the figure below, four narrow bands of bright lights are observed against a black background. And so these, uh, these narrow bands have a characteristic wavelength and the colors are shown in the table below. So there are four very distinct wavelengths uh, the red, there's a green, there's like a bluish color, blue, violet, and a violet color. And these are very distinctive. So when you, uh, when you have this set up where you're, you are causing the atoms in the tube to, to emit light, to emit light, then um, we can see that, that this gets separated into very specific wavelengths. And these are associated with the electrons jumping up, transitioning up and down in different levels. They call it different levels, jumping up a level, jumping down a level. When it jumps up a level and then jumps down, it emits light. Now, the what I'm disputing here is whether this light is a photon, whether it is a, you know, a wave particle duality photon. Is it a particle? Uh, this is what I'm debating. Okay, because uh, the main problem I have here is the is there is a frequency term. There's a frequency term when you convert from wavelength to frequency. Okay, you are basically uh, converting from the domain of cycle to the domain of second, and this is this is the language that I use in modified unit analysis. So this is what leads me to the interpretation that the equation, Planck's energy equation, is actually the, uh, the energy collected in a one second time interval when calibrated to the SI standard of one second of um, the uh, 9,192,631, sorry, 9 billion, 192,631,770 cesium atom oscillations. And so, um, you know, this is uh, my modified unit analysis has led me to the conclusion that the output of that equation is on a per second 
basis. Or a you can think of it as a per unit time basis. So as I showed you in a previous video, unit time doesn't have to be a second, doesn't have to be a second, but whatever unit of time you are calibrated to, the output of that equation is the energy of uh, associated with the unit time. And so when you calibrate to different unit times, you're going to get a different number, obviously. But then when you scale back to the normal standard units, you're going to get the um, you're going to get the energy that is emitted in that unit time, which in the case of the SI time is one second. So just for the sake of argument, I'm going to set up these these two systems here. I'm going to set up one system. These are identical, actually. These are identical systems. Here is the hydrogen tube of hydrogen gas. And this is the detector here, the black detector. Here is the hydrogen uh, gas, the hydrogen um, experiment. And here is the detector. So these two systems are exactly the same. And I'm going to place the detector exactly 299,792,458 meters uh, apart in both in both situations. Okay, so in both and so the unit time in the SI system is this value, this number of oscillations of the cesium atom, and in the S2 system it is an order of magnitude uh, smaller. It is 919,200,000 and 63,177 oscillations of the cesium atom. And this is the uh, unit time of this system. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this, um, the experiment. I'm going to turn, I'm going to run current through this tube for unit time in, in this setup. And I'm going to run um, the current through the tube in uh, for unit time in this in this experimental setup, and I think it's it's obvious to see that um, if I um, if I turn this tube on for this many clock cycles of the cesium atom, okay, for one second. If I turn the tube on for one second, then the light is going to actually reach the detector uh, in one second. So it's going to reach. 299 million, 792,458 meters. It is going to travel that far. That is the speed of light in this setup. Okay. And so, but in this setup, I'm turning the tube on for unit time, but unit time is 10 times shorter than it is in, in this system here. And so when I turn the tube on for unit time, in this system, the light only travels a tenth as far. Okay, the light only travels a tenth as far. The light does not reach the detector, which is 299,792,458 meters away. So if I only turn this on for a tenth of a second, obviously the light is not even going to reach the detector. So I just wanted to make that point, that point clear that of course these two systems are um, are physically different. Uh, the the time the unit time here gives enough time for the detector for the light to reach the detector, and in the system here, if I turn it on only for unit time, only for this many cesium oscillations, the light is not going to reach the detector. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this. Um, this emitter for unit time, and I'm going to collect the energy in this detector for unit time, and then I'm going to do the same thing for this experiment here. And so this, I'm going to turn this on for unit time, and then turn it off again. So I'm going to turn this on for unit time, which is this many cesium atom oscillations, then turn it off. Then I'm going to turn this emitter on for this many cesium atom oscillations, and then I'm going to turn it off. And I think it's obvious to say that um, that this experiment, that this detector, is going to absorb more energy units 
per this unit time than this experiment. This experiment is in, in this unit time in this many cesium atom oscillations. This detector is going to absorb um, a tenth as much unit energy, energy units than this experiment here. So I think that's obvious. Hopefully that's obvious to you as it is to me. Um, so when the experiment is off, there's no energy being emitted or detected. When I turn this one on for one second, this detector is going to detect a certain amount of energy. And when I turn this one on for unit time, which is a tenth as, um, it's a tenth as small, a tenth, it's a tenth as big, sorry, as this, a tenth as, it's a shorter amount of time, I guess is what I'm trying to say. For the shorter amount of time, obviously this detector is going to detect and absorb less energy units. So one of my major complaints about the current system is that, especially in quantum mechanics, is the equations, the main equations for quantum mechanics are written in terms of energy and momentum. And I believe they should be written in terms of power and force. Okay, so this is how I, this is what I do that's different than what mainstream does. Okay, in using standard un, unit analysis, this is what they do. They end up with a little bit of an ugly mess here because especially in the this momentum equation, you end up with the units of this constant being kilograms times a meter, which is nonsense. There, it's, it's not a derived unit. It, this unit doesn't really mean anything. And we've lost reference time in the constant. And so basically what I do quite simply, and I've showed this many times, is um, I don't cancel this unit of time with uh, this unit of time here because this unit of time is actually measure time. Okay, this is measure time. This is the, t the number of seconds. This is time of the experiment. And so an experiment doesn't have to be one second. An experiment can be 10 seconds, 20 seconds. It could be 100 seconds. It could be a million seconds. And so what I do is I divide both sides by this S. Okay, I basically remove this S from here and I put it on the other side over here. Okay, I, there's really, technically there's a hidden T in this equation and I take this T and I put it over here. And so we know from a previous video that power is energy per unit time or energy per time interval. So let's say we're doing an experiment and we do the experiment for 10 seconds. So we set T equal to 10, we collect the energy for 10 seconds and then we divide by 10 to get the power in terms of unit time. So the power has to be in terms of unit time. So yes, the experiment can be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 100 seconds. You do your experiment, you collect your energy for 10 seconds, 100 seconds, whatever. You divide by T, whatever that was, and you get your power in terms of unit time. And the same with this force equation. So with the force equation, you've got, this is a momentum term, actually. I know there's a lot of P's here. One P is for power and one P is for momentum. This, the standard, um, the standard system uses the letter P for momentum and they use the letter M for meter and they use the letter M for mass. It's very confusing. I can't fix that. Uh, all I can do is try to clean up the code a little bit and make it look a little nicer. And so this is a force equation, sorry, this is a force equation. This is a power equation. This power equation is energy per uh, time interval. And if you do your experiment for 10 seconds and collect energy for 10 seconds, you divide by 10 to get the power in terms of unit time. And same with this force equation. Let's say we're doing an experiment and we're trying to calculate the force. We do the experiment for 10 seconds. We divide by 10 to get the force in terms of unit time. And so that is, uh, that is the meaning of this over here. And of course, I've got my little delta terms in here. The unit of Planck's constant in modified unit analysis is joule per cycle. The 
uh, units of Planck's constant over C, which I call the quantum of momentum, has units of momentum per unit per cycle. And of course, frequency has unit cycles per second. And so I put a little delta term in here instead of the numerical value of one, because numer numerical values have no place in the unit section, especially if you plan on using it as the identity of the real numbers, which is done in practice. I also want to point out that this looks much nicer than this. This looks a little bit ugly to me. Um, when I write computer code, I like to make it neat and tidy. And this actually looks much prettier to me. I'm a girl. I like pretty things. This looks much nicer to me. And I'm going, as I'm going to show you, this actually uh, makes more sense. Now, I, I did show in a previous video how I can use this power equation. This, of course, these are the two equations from my specification, which I'm going to find um, right here. And so we these are these two equations, the force equation and the power equation from my specification. And so as I showed in a previous video, I used the, this power equation to calculate the power of a certain wavelength of light, uh, non-amplified wavelength of light, and I divided that um, power by the power of the amplified laser, uh, laser light to get the amplification factor. And then I calculated the force. Using this equation, I calculated the force of that wavelength, that frequency of light. Uh, this is the force of the unamplified uh, light. And then I multiplied that by the amplification factor to get the force that the laser would exert on an object if you turned it on. And so I was able to show that this logic, that what I'm doing here, it actually has practical application. I can use it practically and logically to solve a problem. And so not only is this does this look pretty, but it maps out pretty too. I can it makes sense, it's logical, and I like logic. And so this uh, this is the approach I'm taking, and I'm going to use this approach to show you how I calibrate time to different time scales. And I also want to point out that the output of these two equations is uh, numerically identical to the output of these two equations. The answer that I get is identical, but my interpretation of the output of the, uh, this equation is different in modified unit analysis. And so even though, so the numerology, the numbers that we get, the output of these equations are exactly, 100% exactly the same. There's no difference. The only thing that differs is the interpretation. So I'm interpreting this equation as a power equation and quantum mechanics is interpreting this equation as an energy equation. I'm interpreting this as a force equation and mainstream interprets it as a momentum equation. And so the main question I have when you interpret this as an energy equation is the output of this is the energy of what? The energy of what? Okay, Planck's constant is, I define Planck's constant differently. Planck's constant is an energy constant. It's a quantum of energy in modified unit analysis, and it is a action constant in mainstream. But the output of this equation is what is in dispute right now. Mainstream says that this is the energy of a photon, and I say this is the energy per unit time. It's the energy of this number of oscillations uh, per unit time. And so what you're going to see is when I recalibrate unit time, you're going to see that, that my logic makes more sense than the mainstream logic. And so ultimately what I want to get to is um, the energy of one wavelength of light, of one period of light. Okay, so uh, light is an oscillation. I'm saying it's an oscillation of a medium. Mainstream doesn't have a medium, so they have difficulty with this, but I don't have any difficulty with this because I believe and I know there's a medium. I think there's a medium. I have My logic tells me there's a medium. 
all other waves propagate in medium and so light must also propagate in a medium. So what I want to try to do is I want to try to calculate the energy of one cycle of light, one oscillation of light, one wave period. Okay, I want to I want to calculate the energy that is delivered, that is emitted and delivered and and uh, absorbed uh, of one wavelength of light. So what I did here is I created a little spreadsheet and I calibrated to many different units of time. So S1 is the original unit of time, uh, which is calibrated to 9 billion, 192 million, 631,770 cesium clock units. And then S2 is the one uh, we did before. S2 is divided by 10. So it's 919,263,177 uh, ticks of the cesium clock and so on. So I did this to eight time scales. So I, I rescaled time, the unit of time, uh, by order one order of magnitude up until this point here. And so, um, and then what I did was I recalibrated everything for each of these time scales. And I will show you in a minute why I chose eight time scales. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the scaling factor for each time scale is in this column here. And so the first, uh, the scaling, so this is the scaling factor to get back to S, the standard time, S1, the SI units. And so when you're in SI units, you don't, you multiply by one because you're already in SI units. When you're in S2, you multiply the uh, time factor and the velocity and the momentum by 10 to get back to S1. And in the S3 system, you multiply by 100. In S4, you multiply by 1,000 and, you know, and so on. And so in S8, you actually multiply by, um, by the... Uh, this factor here. And so this, uh, I'm going back to using, I'm using the frequency from the previous video, which is 10 to the 7 uh, cycles per second, which has a wavelength of 29.97, etc. meters. And so, um, so this is, this is, you could uh, say that this wave here is 29.979 meters in length and the period of this uh, of one one period of time in standard units is 0 0.000001 um, uh, units of time so it's a fraction of uh, of the standard unit and so I go through and I recalibrate uh, the speed of light for each of these time scales and so the speed of light in S1 is the normal speed of light in S2, it's divided by 10, and in S3, it's divided by 100. Now, this is, I just want to uh, reemphasize that this does not mean that time is slowing down. It just means that this is the distance that light propagates in the new unit time. Okay, each unit time, so in S3, the cesium atom uh, ticks, you know, a different amount of time than in all the other units. And so uh, this is why I really like uh, this cesium clock reference because the cesium atom, the, the number of, uh, you know, the rate at which the cesium atom uh, oscillates never changes. So no matter what time scale I pick for my unit of time, um, the cesium atom still ticks at the same rate. I'm just reporting the uh, clock time to be different. I'm just, I'm reporting the speed of light to be different. The speed of light, of course, does not change. Uh, the speed of light is the speed of light is the speed of light. It is the rate, rate that uh, light propagates in the medium. So in this column, I report the frequency. Okay, so in the S1 system, 
the um, so I have a light source and the light source emits light at a certain frequency this is uh, a short wave frequency and I believe it is uh, 10 million cycles per second per unit time in the S1 system now in the S2 system which is defined it's uh, on the uh, clock the cesium clock um, a different cesium clock cycle uh, you're going to get a different you're going to report a different frequency so in the s2 system uh, the light the uh, short wave uh, radio light or electromagnetic uh, radiation is going to you're going to report a different value and so on down the line so uh, so that is basically what I'm doing here and you'll notice in the s8 in the s8 system uh, the frequency is one um, one cycle per unit time one cycle per unit time so the unit time in in s8 is 919 uh, cesium atom um, cesium atom oscillations and so uh, so there is a one to uh, 919 so when the cesium clock oscillates 919 times the light my light source um, only oscillates once so this is really what I wanted to get down to I wanted to, I want to get down to one oscillation of light I want to try and measure the energy of one oscillation of light now I want to point out that this this can't be done this cannot be done in using the standard system because uh, when you cancel out this unit of time when you cancel it with the um, the energy component of the constant then you can no longer um, you can no longer model this as a power equation you can no longer model this as a power equation and so you kind of you lose the ability to model this as a power equation and this is, and you also remove the ability to do what I'm doing here and so um, this is why I don't like this and I do like this because it allows me to calibrate one oscillation it allows me to calculate the energy actually of one oscillation of light no matter what the frequency is okay no matter what the frequency is I can calculate the energy of one oscillation of light so the next column here is is the period of the light and so you can see the period of course is the inverse of the frequency and so you can see as the frequency changes now the, this is the frequency um, of each um, each unit each calibrated unit each time unit and so you can see as you go down to when you get down to s8 you find that the the period is equal to one and the frequency is equal to one and so what that means is now we are looking at one oscillation of light one period of light so in the s8 system in 919 cesium atom clock ticks okay in in um, 919 cesium clock ticks we have a frequency of one so the light source that I'm using the shortwave light source can only tick once and that is one period of time this is one period of time and so um, this is really what I want to be getting at because I want to calculate the energy of one period of time which is one oscillation of light which is one wavelength of light and so another thing you'll notice here is in s8 the speed of light is the same as the wavelength of light in fact the wavelength is the same for all these systems because the wavelength of night light never changes I didn't recalibrate the domain of space the domain of space is still the meter the meter was not recalibrated and so if my system is working if I you know back calculate so if I take my new speed of light and divide by the, or if I take 
the new speed of light and divide by the frequency, I'm going to get the wavelength. If I take the new speed of light and divide by the frequency, I'm going to get the wavelength and, and all the way down. And so uh, the wavelength is always the same, obviously. The wavelength, the length, the, the meter per one wavelength does not change. And so that is why these are the same for each of my um, time, units of time, uh, each of my systems. So now we're going to recalibrate Planck's constant. And in modified unit analysis, this is done differently because we're not canceling this unit of S in the units of, of, of uh, Planck's constant. In modified unit analysis, in oscillation mechanics, Planck's constant has the units of joule per cycle. So, um, and we, knew, we know from the previous video that when you scale energy from S, uh, S2 to S1, you have to multiply by 100. So to scale from S1 to S2, we need to divide by 100. And so, uh, so there's a factor of two order of magnitude difference between S1 and S2. And there's a, one, a factor of 100 uh, difference between S2 and S3. And there's a factor of 100 difference between S3 and S4, and so on down the line. So here you can see in this nice spreadsheet, these, uh, uh, Planck's constant is normally uh, 6.6. Uh, 6.626, this rounded up to 3. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. In S2, it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 33. In S3, it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 38. And so on down to S8, where Planck's constant is uh, reported as 6.626 times 10 to the minus 48. So that is how Planck's constant scales in this system, in modified unit analysis, in oscillation mechanics. And in a similar manner, the energy scaling factor to go back, to go from uh, any of these systems back to S1, to the uh, standard, to the SI standard, to the NIST standard, is in this column here. And so if I am in S8 and I want to, and I, and I calculate an energy and I want to scale back to S1, I have to multiply by um, 10 to the 14. I have to multiply by this number here. And if I'm in S7, I need to multiply by 10 to the 12 and so on. And so these are the scaling, the energy scaling factors that I need to use to get back to the standard that we know and love. So next, in this column, what I'm doing is I am um, applying this equation, Planck's energy equation. Um, I'm uh, using this equation to calculate the uh, energy uh, based on the frequencies and based on Planck's constant. So when I use the Planck's constant from each column and the frequency from each column, I get the um, energy um, that it would be reported in each time unit system. Okay, so each of these time unit systems has been calibrated to, um, to give us uh, the results for each um, system. So this would be, so if I don't do any scaling of time uh, and I use E equals HF, I get 6.5. 626 times 10 to the minus 27 joules. And if I use the S2 system, I get 6.626 times 10 to the minus 30 um, joules, but they're not joules, they're S2 joules. Okay, and then if I use uh, each of these systems, you can see that each time it goes down by a factor of three. Okay, it goes down by a factor of three. And so, um, so these are the values that I get when I apply, when I multiply this frequency by this um, Planck constant. And so these are, the, these are the results I get. And then if I use this scaling factor, if I use the scaling factor 
to get back to S1, this is where it gets interesting because when we, when we did it using standard unit analysis, we got the same number as we got when um, in both systems. So when I scaled back, when I scaled back, I got the same value for S2 as what S1 calculated. But in this case, when I scale back, I get different values. I get different values. And so this makes sense in terms of modified unit analysis because what we are doing is we are counting the number of um, the the number of energy units per unit time. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this equation for a second before we look at it. What this is calculating, what this is calculating is, as I said before, if you did an experiment for 10 seconds, then you have to divide by 10 to get the power in terms of unit time. So the units of um, this power equation is energy per unit time. Energy per unit time. So, um, and the unit time is changing for each of these time scales. So this is the energy per unit time per second. So I believe that this is uh, the energy per unit time, which is in this case in S1 is one second. And this is the energy per the new unit time, S2. And this is the energy per the new unit time, S3. And so in S1, we have um, 10 to the 7 oscillations per unit time. In this system, we have 10 to the 6 oscillations per unit time. And in this system, we have 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 1 and 10 to the 0. So in S8, we have um, this frequency per unit time. We have one oscillation per unit time. So in S8, we are actually calibrated to one oscillation of this shortwave radio signal. And this is why I chose uh, a nice even number, like um, I think it's 10, 10 million uh, cycles per second for the S1 system, because I can get down, I can get down to one cycle, and now I can calculate the energy of one cycle. So again, I want, to, um, I want to emphasize the fact that this equation is calculating the energy per unit time, the energy per unit time. So uh, in S8, I'm calculating the energy per unit time, and the unit time is one wavelength, one period, one oscillation per unit time. And so you can see this is a very small value. It's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 48. This is the energy of one oscillation of light in the S8 system, in the S8 system. So now, in order to convert back to the S1 system, I multi and this is an energy term. So the output of, of, of this equation is an energy term. So now to convert back, to the S1 system, to the, the NIST standard, the standard that we know and love, I have to multiply by 10, this, the energy scaling factor, which is 10 to the 14. And when I do that, I get 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per cycle. So this is the answer that I think is right. This is what I've been saying all along. The logic that I show here proves that I could be right. Okay, the logic I show here proves that I could be right, that one oscillation of light. Now, keep in mind that I, I had to scale back to the S1 system. When I scale back to the S1 system, I get, and so only the S8 system, only the S8 system is calibrated to one oscillation, one wavelength, one period of light. Okay, so all the other systems are calibrated to multiple periods of light. And so um, when I, when I uh, scale back to the S1 system, I get that the energy of one oscillation of light is 6.626 times 10 to the 34 joules. Exactly what I'm saying here is that 
the Planck's constant is the energy of one cycle, one cycle of light. One oscillation, one period, one cycle of light. So, I mean, this logic is pretty solid. It's pretty sound. Um, it, it gives me the uh, result that I, uh, I'm, not, I'm gonna say that I expected because I didn't actually expect to be right. But when I did the logic, I discovered that I was right, that um, this, the energy of one cycle of light, no matter what wavelength, no matter what wavelength, is going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules. So I know at this point, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that you know that different, different uh, wavelengths of light are associated with different energies. We know this is true, but in reality, it is the different frequencies of light, which happen to have different wavelengths, are associated with different energies. So um, a, a wave with less oscillations per unit time is going to accumulate a different amount of energy in a detector, which might be over here, as a uh, wave with a uh, or a um, wave with a frequency with a higher frequency. So higher frequencies are going to accumulate more energy per unit time as a lower frequency. And so this is why different wavelengths of light are associated with different energies, but in fact it's different frequencies of light are associated with uh, different energies. And, um, and, you know, different wavelengths are really associated with different frequencies. And so using my line of thinking, basically what I'm doing is I'm zooming in on, in the fractal sense, I'm zooming in on one wavelength of light. And when I do that, I discover that each wavelength of light, each wavelength of light um, delivers... 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules of energy to a detector. But when you have a higher frequency, you're going to get more energy units per unit time, per unit time. And um, if the frequency is lower, you're going to get less energy units per unit time. So in oscillation mechanics, I do everything in the frequency domain, and when I do everything in the frequency domain, um, I get a different logic than mainstream that tends to do everything in the wavelength domain. And so yes, you are right when you say different wavelengths of light are associated with different energies, and I am right when I say different frequencies of light are associated with different energies. Okay, so the energy is being delivered on a, um, a per unit time basis. Okay, so let's get back to this equation here. The power equation here is the energy per unit time. It's the energy per unit time. And so this is the energy collected per unit time. The output of this equation interprets as the energy collected per unit time. And so obviously this frequency here is going to deliver more energy units per unit time. Let's pretend this is unit time. Let's pretend this is one second. A wavelength with a higher frequency is going to deliver more units, energy units per unit time than a, um, a frequency, a light emission with a lower, smaller wavelength. Uh, an emission with a smaller wavelength is going to have a lower frequency. And when you do everything in the frequency domain, you lose the concept of wavelength. Um, the wavelength becomes less important and it's the frequency that becomes important. And this is where I get my logic from. This is where my logic is coming from. And this is why this is why in modified unit analysis, I convert everything to the frequency domain. So I don't have to deal with wavelength at all. I don't have to deal with wavelength at all. I do everything in the frequency domain. If I want wavelength, I can convert back to wavelength and get the right answer. So I just take the speed of light and divide it by the frequency and get, the, get back the wavelength. And so this is a frequency-centric 
uh, approach. I'm taking a frequency centric approach instead of a wavelength um, centric approach. And that is why I am calling this oscillation mechanics because I am doing everything in terms of oscillation. So to further prove my point, what I do is I apply the same logic to a frequency of light, to a wavelength of light that we know. Um, I applied it to this red um, emission from the um, gas discharge tube uh, filled with hydrogen. And when I do that, um, I'm not going to go through the details here, but you can have a close look and, and uh, check my numbers for me. But when I apply the same logic that I applied here, so in this case, uh, in this frequency of light, um, S, S8 was uh, calibrated to one cycle. And in this, in right here, S9 is calibrated to one cycle. And I find that when I do the math, when I, when I apply the same logic to an actual frequency of light that we know, an actual wavelength of light that we know, I, I get that I, this wavelength, the energy of this wavelength is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules. So here is what I think the problem is. Here is where I think we run into trouble. So here is a spreadsheet of the, um, the way I did it before in the previous video. Um, and, but I'm gonna do it the standard way where you cancel the units, where the units are canceled, and I'm going to recalibrate Planck's constant to uh, using these units here. And when you do that, you get Planck's constant decreasing by uh, one order of magnitude for each uh, time scale, for each unit of time that I'm calibrating to. And so for S1, it's normal. For S2, it's 10 to the minus 35, 10 to the minus 36, 10 to the minus 37, etc. So it's only changing by one order of magnitude instead of two orders of magnitude. And so I think what the problem is, and so when you do it, when you do it this way, when you do it this way, and then you scale back to the S1 scale, you end up getting the same value back every time. Okay, so you end up getting the same value back every time. And so I think this is what gives the illusion that this is the energy of a photon. But in fact, this is the energy, in my opinion, this is the energy of... Um, one second's worth of oscillation because we're scaling back to the one second when we uh, apply the scaling factor to, um, to the energy output, which is calculated here. And we end up with the energy of uh, per unit time of the S1 system. And so I think what's going on here is... Um, when you scale Planck's constant as an action constant, let's do it uh, with this. So we, we're not going to cancel. We're going to scale the energy component first, which is going to be a, uh, you're going to divide by 100 to scale Planck's constant. And then we're, when you apply this unit of time here, which is, so this is in the uh, denominator, this is in the numerator. So when it's in the, in the denominator, you make it, a you know, 100 times smaller. And now with this S in the numerator, I have to make Planck's constant um, 10 times bigger. So you're making it 100 times smaller, then you're making it 10 times bigger. And so, um, so I think this is the problem here. I think uh, for all intents and purposes, what's happening is you're unscaling. So for, for, each, um, for each time unit, Okay, for each unit of time that I've calibrated, um, the uh, frequency has to get scaled as well because in you know nine billion cesium atom clocks, my light source can tick this many times, but in this many cesium atom clocks, the frequency can only uh, the uh, light source can only tick this many times, and in uh, this many cesium clocks, the frequency can only uh, of the light can only tick once. I can only get one oscillation in 919 cesium clock um, ticks. And so, um, 
essentially what you're doing here when you're canceling this S and then you're rescaling Planck's constant, uh, only one order of magnitude, you're actually undoing, you're actually undoing the scaling that we just did with, uh, with the frequency term. So we're, um, we're scaling the energy by a factor of, of two, and then we're unscaling it by a factor of, sorry, by a, an, two orders of magnitude, and then we're rescaling by one order of magnitude. But for all, for all intents and purposes, what we're doing is we're undoing the frequency scaling. So it's as if we uh, are not scaling the frequency. And so what I did here was I created a spreadsheet where I did it, uh, where I used, I scaled Planck's constant the way I do with, um, just with the energy term. And then, but then I forget to scale the frequency. And when you do that, you, when I make the mistake of not scaling the frequency, I get the same results that I get when I uh, apply the, you know, Planck, when I scale Planck's constant the way mainstream would scale it. And so um, I believe this is the wrong thing to do. This, um, so this is obviously wrong because for each time scale, the frequency is going to change. So obviously in 919 um, cesium clock ticks, um, my light source cannot tick 10 million times. And so this is a mistake. And when I propagate this mistake uh, in my spreadsheet, I get the same results that I get the way the standard approach um, would work. And so this is more evidence that um, this approach is wrong. This is more evidence that what they're doing here is uh, incorrect that it is a bug, that it is a, uh, I'm gonna, a mistake. And the mistake is not in the numerology because obviously the outputs of these equations are the same. The mistake is in the interpretation. The mistake is in the interpretation. And so when you do it uh, the way I do it, you discover that higher frequencies of light deliver more energy units to a detector in unit time and lower frequency larger wavelengths of light deliver less energy units to a detector in unit time. And so um, it is my gut feeling, it is my opinion that my approach uh, leads to a better understanding of light in terms of, um, especially when you do it in the frequency domain. Okay, so it is my opinion that um, modeling this equation as a power equation and modeling this equation as the force equation is the right thing to do. And I can apply this directly to a problem like I did in the previous video and get um, and do it logically and get the right answer um, using logic and not just applying equations blindly and not knowing what they're doing. And so I think this is the right thing to do. I think I'm on the right track. Um, Basically, what I'm saying is, uh, it can, I can say this two ways. I can say the photon doesn't exist, or I can say one wavelength of light is a photon. Okay, so in my line of thinking, I might be inclined to say that one wavelength of light is a photon, but I don't want to call it a photon because the photon has you know, is going to confuse people. If I call it a photon, people are going to be confused. So I call it an ohm particle. And now you know why I have a website called www.theohmparticle.com and why I started writing a book called The Ohm Particle. So I am loosely calling one oscillation of light an ohm particle. Yes, it is a wave. But when a wave crashes into the shore, it becomes a particle. And so uh, I'm going to loosely call this an ohm particle instead of calling it a photon to distinguish it from the standard language. So uh, that's, I'm going to leave it at that. This video is getting quite long and I don't want to have to make another video. So I'm going to leave it at this. 
I think I made my point clear in this video and I hope you get what I'm trying to say. So yeah, thank you very much and um, I'll be back.